Again, fundamentally, if we say what is lactose intolerance, lactose intolerance is poor digestion, right? So it's a reduction of the ability to digest or break down lactose into um, its, its, its smaller particles. And let's, let's show you what that, what that might look like here. Let's blow this up on the screen. So this is, uh, again, this is published, just recently published in the journal Nutrients. Um, this study on, you see on the left-hand side, this normal lactose digestion here. And um, so you get normal digestion on that left side of the diagram where you take lactose here. Okay, you can see it looks like almost like two tiny stop signs that are connected together, two little tiny different shaded blue stop signs. One of those stop signs is made out of galactose, which is a, uh, is a, is a sub-sugar of lactose, and the other is made out of glucose. So you get one molecule of galactose, one molecule of glucose. A special enzyme called lactase breaks that lactose apart into those two individual molecules and then it enters your bloodstream and your body can use galactose and glucose as energy substrates so it can convert those into energy to help you digest your food. Then we have this right side of this diagram showing lactose intolerance which again is where lactose okay, is not properly broken down so there's, there's not enough lactase out here to do the job and so what happens is this lactose shows up in the, in the large intestine of the colon and the bacteria, the massive quantity of bacteria in the colon will ferment that sugar creating gas as a byproduct and this is why that hydrogen breath test can come back positive because part of one of the byproducts of, of fermentation of this sugar is hydrogen, H2. That's what you see right here, H2. The other gas that you see here is CH4. That's methane gas. And this is, you know, this is, again, these are gassy byproducts as a result of fermenting sugar, right? If you ever made alcohol before, if you ever watched a TV show on how they make alcohol, what do they do? They take bacteria and they take sugar and that the bacteria eats up the sugar fermenting it and you get gas as a byproduct. That's why when you make at home, if you ever made your own sauerkraut or made your own ferment and it sits there in a jar, it's bubbling. What's it bubbling? Because these gases are being produced and they're pressurizing that lid and it's creating that bubbling effect. Well, the, one of the problems with this is if you get a ton of gas in your GI tract, you're going to get symptoms, right? That's the gas, the bloating, the abdominal discomfort, the diarrhea potentially, um, all those linked again up to not being able to break that down and having the bacteria in your colon instead of the enzyme in your small intestine breaking down that sugar, your bacteria have to actually ferment it. And remember that you know one of the byproducts too of fermentation that gets rarely discussed in biology with doctors is alcohol, right? So now, you know, what does alcohol do? It travels to the liver as well, and it can damage the liver over time. The more you have to use bacteria to ferment your food instead of actually digesting it with digestive enzyme power, the more potential for alcohol you have. There's actually a condition in humans called auto brewery syndrome, which is where you produce your own ferments of alcohol, and it actually makes you drunk, and you stay drunk. I've actually had, had patients walk into my office who were dizzy, who were jaundiced, yellow eyes, yellow skin. I could have sworn to you they, would, they were inebriated or drunk, but they actually had a major problem, not just with lacto lactose and lactase, for example, but you see this is very common too when the GI tract is, has a yeast overgrowth. Yeast are also known to create this type of problem, even in the absence of lactose intolerance. We come over here to this side, you see lactose maldigestion, malabsorption, and intolerance. You see clinical conditions leading to the diagnosis secondary hypolactasia, meaning basically leading to a, an inability, because there's a genetic version of, of having lactose intolerance, which is generally found much earlier on, but then there are what are called secondary causes. So these are other things that in life that can happen to us that can lead to us not producing adequate quantities of this uh, lactase enzyme to break down lactose. And one of them is severe malnutrition. This is, you've heard me talk about this time and again. This is why it's so important to measure nutrition status. 
because certain nutrients are necessary, especially like zinc, to produce lactase. If you, how do we make lactase? Well, we make it in the brush border of our small intestine. So anything that damages that brush border can reduce our ability to produce that enzyme. But we also need nutrients to build that enzyme. We need protein and severe malnutrition um, can, can, can be a reason as to why a person will develop this issue. We know that celiac disease, as I showed you research a moment ago, that sometimes the only, only symptom of celiac disease is actually the development of lactose intolerance. We also know inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, regional colitis. There are a number of different inflammatory bowel conditions that can lead to this diagnosis. We also know in addition that bacteria and viral infection in the GI tract, parasitic infection in the GI tract can also damage what? Can damage the brush border leading to reduction in the ability to produce the enzyme lactase that, that again, that breaks down lactose. Actinic enteritis. We also know certain pharmacological treatments. There are a few examples here, but some of these are antibiotics and some of these are chemotherapeutic agents. So we'll see this a lot in people going through cancer treatment. It's one of the reasons their guts can't, can't, um, can't thrive super well is the chemo destroys the lining of the gut and reduces their ability to tolerate certain foods. This is one of them. We also know antibiotics. We could put antibiotics on this list as well. And then some post-surgical conditions, um, post-surgery, like short bowel syndrome. When, if you've had part of your bowels removed, right, due to chronic, usually because of chronic inflammatory disease, um, you have short bowel, which means you have less space to digest your food. You have less transit area to digest that food and that can lead to intolerance as well. So again, these are all reasons as to why that can develop. These aren't the only reasons. We've got other ones as well. And one of them, as I mentioned earlier, is pesticide. Pesticides, when you're eating non-organic, just think about, you know, why is it so important to eat organic food? One of the reasons is to avoid these pesticides. What do these pesticides do? They're, they're antibiotics. Right, and wipe out our microbiome. What, what science has been discovering really over the last 25 to 35 years, more and more and more, we realize just how important the microbiome is, how much it helps protect you from disease, how much it helps to help you digest your food, helps your immune system recognize good from bad, helps you produce vitamins, it helps produce a substance that coats your GI tract and prevents it from leaking. Well, when you're eating non-organic every day, you're basically getting in low doses of antibiotics. You're destroying your microbiome, right? You're, you're reducing the capacity for your microbiome to protect you and function for you. And therefore, you're laying the framework or the groundwork for this disease. We know bacterial problems, whether it's infection or overgrowth, okay, here, or whether it's foods that you're eating that are creating imbalances in bacteria. We know gluten, for example, can create bacterial imbalance in the GI tract. If you haven't watched my Glutenology Masterclass, go watch it. I talk in depth about why that actually can happen. We know that medications, as I mentioned before, certain medications, particularly though antibiotics, as, as we were mentioning, but also we know there are other things that hinder digestion. Antacids are, are another example. Proton pump inhibitors um, as a class. H2 antagonists or, or histamine 2 antagonists are medicines that, re, you know, that reduce your body's ability to produce stomach acid, which are going to hinder your digestion. And that's going to hinder di not just digestion in your stomach, it's going to hinder digestion all the way south as well. There are other medications that we know can damage the gut. What damages the gut? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. You know, when your doctor tells you to take that aspirin every day for your risk of heart disease, that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's eroding the mucosal barrier of your GI tract, contributing to damage to your gut. We know that steroids, okay, oral steroids can cause the same kind of problem. And when you mix these two NSAIDs plus steroids equals a seven to ten-fold increase in that damage. This is even more dangerous when you're taking both of these things simultaneously. Um, again, there are a number of medicines that we know can damage the GI tract. There's certain blood pressure medications that can as well. But point being, 
if you're relying on medicines to try to keep you healthy, you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong uh, philosophy tree, if you will. Medicines don't get you better. Medicines mask your symptoms so that you don't ever understand where they're coming from, but they just suppress them. And you, you do that for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, you create massive quantities of damage. One of the things medicines can also do is they can cause nutritional deficiencies, but beyond medicines causing nutritional deficiencies, poor diet, processed food, you know, perfect example here, um, let's just look at an egg as, as an example. If you buy an egg from a standard commercial uh, egg producing farm where the eggs are, you know, all cooped up in tight pens, they don't get sunshine, they don't get exercise, they don't get grass, they're being fed predominantly what? Grain, right? Those eggs have two times less vitamin E, they have eight times less beta carotene, about two and a half times less vitamin A, and approximately two times less omega-3 fat. So just compare a pasture egg to a grain-fed commercial produced egg, look at how much less nutrition you get from that egg than you get from a healthy egg. This is one of the culprits behind nutritional deficiencies. When your cows are being fed mass production, GMO grains loaded with pesticides, when your chickens are being fed that, when your hogs are being fed that, and when they're all cooped up and they're all you know, crowded in, in areas where they don't have room to breathe and maneuver, the nutritional density and the quality of the food deteriorates. We see the same thing. It's not just with animals, folks. It's also with the crops that are grown, the monocropping, the way our agriculture is done is you strip away the land and you add nitrogen to the soil so that things grow really fast. But when things grow really fast, they have less time to pull nutrients from the soil. And if the soil has been depleted because it's been over farmed, you have less nutrients to pull from the soil. We know today the way farming is done that, that produce Fruits and vegetables are less nutrient dense. We know that our animals and their byproducts are less nutrient dense. This is why it's so important that you support organic, you know, sustainable agriculture. And when I say sustainable, I mean done in the right way. Um, there's this big, there's this big movement right now toward you know chasing cow farts and demonizing cow farts and demonizing animals in the way that they're grown. It's not the animals that are the problem. It's the in, it's the it's the nature of how the farmers are doing it, and it's not just the cows. It's also that GMO-grown soy and other plant-based products that they're using to make some of these processed foods, plant-based foods that they're calling healthy. So you got to keep those things in mind. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.